In this video I have three things that have made me stop and think about Star Trek Discovery and the Orville. After this. Hello out there, I'm the oldest nerd. The three things that I was encountering was first an article in comicbook.com which related a speech that Les Moonves gave to a convention in San Francisco. Another was a Google Talks encounter with Seth MacFarlane and some members of his production team. I'll link all of those, by the way, down in the comments section. And uh, the third was a Newsweek article that came out talking about if Star Trek were free. One of the things that surprised me about the comic book article uh, with Moonves, uh, the president of CBS, talking about why Star Trek was placed as an element of uh, all access rather than on the network. I had assumed, first of all, that it was on all access because it would be more money for CBS. And in fact, that really wasn't the, at the attitude at all. They probably could have made more money on it on the main network than they could have on a streaming service, and they could have made a lot more money on Netflix uh, than they have done on CBS All Access. Uh, his idea was that what they wanted to do was to make the platform more available to people so they could put more stuff on it and that Star Trek was kind of the linchpin in order to get that started. Now, that's not unusual. That's not anything that surprises us. What did surprise me, though, was that in doing so, it was more to facilitate the serial format that Discovery has taken rather than the episodic format that works on the network. They essentially did not want to put it on the network because they did not want to make it into episodes. They wanted to make it into a long story arc. And I find this kind of interesting. That, of course, is the way that a lot of streaming services are presenting their programs these days. And it is true that the networks are doing more episodic things. So uh, I found that kind of interesting. And at the same time, uh, the um, interview with Google Talks that Seth MacFarlane did was exactly the opposite thing. Uh, he did not want to go to a streaming service because he wanted to have um, episodes that are separate. He said that I'm kind of used to that doing shows like Family Guy where you take an idea and you develop it through an, uh, a single episode and then you move on to the next idea. And that was one of the things that really appealed to him as a writer about Star Trek, uh, especially the next generation, which is what he's mostly patterned after, he said. His favorite captain, he said, was Picard. So it's not a surprise that the overall feel of the Orville is very much like the next generation. You have a different kind of captain, and he talked about that, and we'll talk about that in a second, of how uh, he wanted to differentiate it. But the way that he wanted to make it the same is rather compelling, that he wanted to tell different stories with different morals, with different uh, aims, whereas Moonves wanted to have something that was more serialized, something that became more soap opera, something that you would want to uh, follow and in order, something that just isn't reasonable to do on a network show. So that's uh, an interesting idea that had not occurred to me before that the structure of the program itself dictated the platform rather than the other way around, which is kind of what I was thinking at, uh, to begin with. So we continue on with what, what uh, Seth MacFarlane was talking about. His favorite captain, he said, was Jean-Luc Picard, except that he thought that they were, and it's something that we've talked about too, they were too formal, they were too Shakespearean, they were too um, Melville and uh, caught in classic literature because of their intent to stay outside of contemporary times in order to be futuristic, you have to make reference to something that the audience is going to understand. And perhaps the only way that you can do that is to go way in the past, uh, something that would have survived into the 24th century. So uh, that was the limitation they had on it. And the reason that Seth MacFarlane, it seems, wanted to uh, 
maintain the more dated situation that, that we've criticized him for here was in order to make the space service more like a military service of today, to have a situation where when people are off duty, they are less formal, they are goofing around with each other, they're telling jokes, they're drinking, they're having parties, they're fraternizing with each other. They only hinted at this the next generation. I mean, you know, you see, okay, Orf, Orf is going to visit Deanna, and there's this on-off relationship between Riker and Deanna, and uh, there was uh, Data and Tasha, and, and other things like this. But they were all very isolated, and they were all very just, we need to use this to define the character. Whereas in the Orville, it seems to be a method by which to define the whole universe. The whole idea that this is not just to isolate the characters, but rather to tell you that what we're doing is telling you a story about people. And um, that's what I think makes the Orville so good, that it does have that human element I don't think we've ever seen in science fiction before because they've been so careful to maintain their futurism that they sometimes forget the humanity in the rush. Another thing Seth MacFarlane was talking about in this same interview was the way that he shot the show. And I found this kind of interesting. First of all, he uses actual models. I did not know this. The Orville is a model. It was 3D printed and it's about eh, this big and made out of plastic, of course, but uh, very detailed and they use it for the flyby and the close up shots and for things that are more involved, they'll use a CG version. But uh, it wasn't just for budgetary reasons that they decided to go with a model. Seth MacFarlane said that after having done cartoons up to this point, He's found that special effect ships and things like that look cartoonish to him and that he wanted something that reflects light like something real does, something that, that has uh, a physicality to it rather than just um, something CG. And that is kind of interesting. I find that I enjoyed The Next Generation, which was uh, probably the last Star Trek to use actual models. Uh, better than I did, say, Enterprise or Voyager, which use CG models. Um, I don't know if DS9 did or not. Somebody will tell me in the comments. But uh, that's uh, also an interesting thing. Also, his shots were all planned ahead. They were very storyboarded uh, in the way also that he did cartoons. Seth MacFarlane said you had to know what you were going to do before you shot it. And so uh, he did the same way or does the same way with the Orville in that there's not a lot of let's try this from this angle and let's try this from this angle. That's more economical in weekly television and uh, it also uh, makes you have to plan more carefully and uh, the program is obviously carefully planned. The third article was in Newsweek. I saw this online just a couple of days ago and they were talking about fan films and copyright. Now they said that under the original copyright law before it was amended in 1909 and later in the 90s that uh, the first season of Star Trek would have been in the public domain. Wouldn't that have been interesting? Uh, as it is, uh, uh, copyrights will not be up on the original series in 2066, probably, since uh, the show began in 1966. So uh, this is the, um, uh, the problem with copyrights, generally speaking. We won't get into all of that, but we will mention that Paramount has been um, uneven, shall we say, in its enforcement of its copyright rules. Uh, if there's something that they think is going to be of benefit to them, like a lot of fan films that have been made, uh, they turn a blind eye to it, uh, a deaf ear to it. And when they were about to put out, uh, what was it, Star Trek Into Darkness, uh, they had some problems with um, the Axanar. And this probably was brought upon it by J.J. Abrams more than it was Paramount because they've been letting this stuff kind of sift through, but uh, because of J.J.'s objection to this and some other problems that he had with uh, making the movie, which had to do with merchandising and things which were already tied up and other things. 
leading his eventual wanting to go and do Star Wars. I think it made them want to clamp down on copyrights and create this whole thing that the film can't be more than 15 minutes long, uh, it can't make any profit, it can't have any stars uh, from previous series in it and things like this. Um, the article suggests that copyright law may be challenged based on Star Trek because there has been so much positivity in fan fiction, in fan films, and in other um, celebrations of the franchise that has done nothing but help the existence and continuance of the show as we know it. And this may be considered. And uh, in doing so, it may change the way copyright is viewed and the way copyright is enforced. It's an interesting article. I recommend it to you. And uh, in the meantime, what your opinions are on copyright, on Star Trek fan films and fan fiction, uh, what you think about uh, the various ways that uh, these shows were made between the Orville and Star Trek, I'd be interested to hear your opinion on it. Also, if you'd click a like, that would be nice too. It's always something that brightens my day. Also, uh, don't forget to subscribe, and until next time, don't go far.